Okay, well, um, I think we'll make a start. Um, so, uh, so welcome to everybody um, who's uh, joining this, uh, this online event. Um, one of the great things about these online events is that they erode the traditional geographical boundaries. Um, so, in fact, we have 85 people um, signed up to attend from pretty much all the way around the country from and all the BCA regions. Um, I'm Phil Armitage from uh, Max Fordham LLP. Uh, I'm a senior partner there and we're a firm of consulting um, services and environmental engineers. I'm a committee a member for the East Anglia chapter, which is based in Cambridge, um, and it's part of the, the Midlands and East Anglia region. Um, I, I see the central BCO purpose, you know, from my point of view, as improving the quality of life uh, for people in the workplace um, through research and education. And I see these technical talks um, as important ways of disseminating information. Um, acoustics, which is today's subject, um, is an important aspect of creating um, high quality and comfortable environments for people. Um, it's often thought of as a black art, and I think that may have been the case in the past, um, but it's become a highly engineered discipline um, with computational analysis making the more esoteric um, aspects very accessible. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce um, Sam Bryant of Cass Allen, um, who's going to talk about the acoustic design of offices. Um, he's a director at Cass Allen and joined um, eight years ago um, following a, a period working in underwater environmental acoustics. Um, he's uh, uh, designed the acoustics um, for a number of large-scale residential developments, schools and commercial buildings, um, which includes a number of large offices um, and uh, has recently assisted in designing the new offices of one of the UK's largest property developers. Um, and as a firm, Cass Allen obviously have a, a broad portfolio um, and have worked on offices and commercial buildings for a wide range of clients, including LinkedIn, Cancer Research UK and the Labs Group. Um, in terms of housekeeping for the event, um, obviously I don't need to show you where the fire exits are, which is one benefit of these things. Um, Sam's presentation should last about half an hour uh, and there'll be uh, opportunity for questions, uh, a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, if you'll, at the bottom of your screen, I, I think that might be true of all the, um, uh, the variants of Zoom, um, there is a Q&A button. So if you could use that, please, to pose your questions, um, then feel free to post them as they occur to you. Um, and then we'll keep them all and go through them all at the end of the talk. Um, and then just so you know, if you want to relive any of the really funny bits um, or share this with your colleagues later, um, then this is being recorded and will be made available through the BCO YouTube channel um, after the event. So Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for the invitation to come talk today. I hope you find it all very interesting. Um, the idea today is really not to get into too much detail or take the um, take it too far. Oops, I do apologise. Uh, take it too far in terms of the. Um, the 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 nuts and bolts and the this document says this this document says this type thing and it's more to give you a flavor of the things that are generally considered in terms of acoustics um, as you look at the design of an office and the all the ancillary areas and facilities um, the there there will be a few examples where um, i talk you through exactly how we would go through that process um, again, not too technical, but hopefully will be of interest. Um, I know there's quite a wide range of people here uh, uh, attending today. So without further ado, really, um, here are the sort of the seven steps, if you like, of uh, office design and fit out. Um, as you might expect, the, the first step would be a, a noise survey of the site. Um, that's generally done at the planning application stage. Um, but can also be done at the sort of detailed design stage. Um, and it aids the design um, the, uh, in, in various ways and also basically helps you get planning permission for the site. Um, but we won't go into too much detail on those today. Uh, just um, leave that to your acoustician, basically. Um, so you, you've carried out the noise survey. And the first thing to consider really is, say you're building next to a railway or a busy road, how do you control that noise coming in? Because um, obviously you can't, you can't have it too loud inside an office. 
and we'll discuss what too loud is. Um, so how do you go about controlling that? Um, well, the aim obviously is for occupants to concentrate, work effectively, um, be able to communicate, um, all those sorts of things that are necessary for a productive office. And so the objective really is to achieve a good internal noise environment. Now, the question of course is, what is good? Um, there are various documents all around the world, um, including one from the BCO itself. Um, but a very useful place to start is British Standard 8233, which was produced or updated in 2014. And that contains some, some really, really useful guidance. Um, there are a few tables and lots and lots of uh, topics covered within that document, um, but it does cover offices. It says an open plan office shouldn't have noise levels above 50 decibels. LAEQ just means average, and we'll, we'll always be talking about average noise levels. So the average noise level over the occupied period. Um, but also has a, a lower range, and um, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later, but really you're looking for 45 to 50 dB in an open plan office. On the other hand, if it were, say, a staff meeting room, training room, or an executive office, you'd want that to be slightly quieter. Um, executive offices um, tend to be you know, single occupancy, um, people doing very uh, complicated, important work. Um, and meeting rooms and training rooms where uh, relaxation is important, but also communication is very important. And 8233 also has this really useful paragraph, which basically covers absolutely everything you might want to think about in terms of acoustics and offices. Um, so complaints, they talk, the phrase it in the complaints, but basically it's, you should consider intrusion of inter external noise, high internal noise levels from services, low background noise levels and excessive reflections from room services, surfaces, sorry. Um, inadequate sound insulation between offices is a frequent cause of complaint and that's often what we're um, asked to have a look at, um, where one room to another requires a degree of privacy. So let's start with that first point, ex intrusion of external noise. So how do you achieve those, those figures that we just talked about? In, in this example, there's a, say an office block um, next to a railway line, which is just, just an example. So there's your railway line there, and we're gonna say for the, for the purpose of this uh, example, it's an executive office, and outside the average noise level is 75 decibels from that railway line. And inside, we're aiming for 35 in accordance with the uh, 8233. So obviously we need 40 dB reduction. Now, what does that actually look like? How do, you, how do you go about achieving 40 dB of reduction? Is that a lot, is that not a lot? Well, the first thing to do is establish where you need the reduction. And we typically build a noise model of any site where you can input the, how loud the road is, how loud the railway line is. And essentially you um, press calculate, and it shows you how noise spreads around the site. Uh, hopefully you can see that in this example, the black and white dotted line is the railway, and the, uh, the colored dots on the building show you exactly how loud it is at any given point. And that essentially tells you how much you need to reduce the noise by. Um, and then that leads to a facade spec, which we would generally present like this, where different areas require different sound reduction. Um, and in our example, we're looking for 40 decibels. So really, um, the noise generally finds the path of least resistance. Um, so in most cases, that would be through the glazing and through any ventilators that lead directly into the occupied rooms. And at its most basic, your standard off the shelf, go to b and and buy some glazing sort of thing, um, with your standard in-frame hit and miss trickle vents, not any acoustically upgrades uh, to it at all, will give you about 30 dB reduction. Uh, obviously that's the lowest cost, but isn't quite enough for what we're looking for. Um, so what you would do is you acoustically upgrade the glass and the trickle vent. And the next step up, you know, you go from totally not upgraded to a bit upgraded, 
and that gets you in the 30 to 35 dB range. Um, and that would be good for minor, minor upgrades. The next step up um, would be even further um, thickness in the glazing or even laminated glass. And at this point, you're looking at things like through wall ventilators, uh, which we know aren't, well, firstly, aren't very common in office developments. And also developers in general don't like them for residential developments because they are a bit of a pain to fit and um, not considered particularly attractive. Um, and the most common ventilation strategy for offices that we're seeing these days is obviously mechanical ventilation, MVHR. Um, and in this case, uh, it would be more than likely that MVHR is required to deal with the noise, but in any case, it would probably be provided. And 40 dB is very high acoustic performance glass, which you would probably imagine building right next to a railway line. If it were an extremely noisy railway line, say a high speed railway line, or you know, you're a meter away from the M1 sort of thing, then you might want to look at things like secondary glazing, which is an additional layer of glass within the double glazing. Um, and that provides very high acoustic performance. And obviously we're, we're sticking with MVHR. So the design response really depends on how loud it is outside and what you're looking for inside. In our example, it was very loud outside and we wanted it to be very quiet inside. And so we needed a high performance um, system. As I said, noise finds the path of least resistance. So where it's a sort of brick or block work clad uh, building, that's, you know, that's very commonly um, the case that the noise will just come through the glazing and the vents. However, it's, it's very common that um, with lightweight facades, there are uh, spandrel panels or lightweight um, areas which do lead into the occupied areas and they need to be considered alongside the glazing and the ventilation but that is a sort of case by case thing. The other thing to think about is um, overheating and this is uh, a tricky subject and offices tend to have the mechanical ventilation it's also quite common for, for them to have things like comfort cooling or some form of air conditioning. Um, but where there is a reliance on opening windows to control overheating, then if you're next to a noisy railway site, uh, a railway line, for example, then noise coming in can be excessive. And so finding the balance between um, the uh, thermal comfort and the acoustic comfort is very tricky. Um, there's currently no guidance available uh, that really tells you exactly what to do. There's some general guidance that gives you a hint, but it's certainly not um, cut and dry, if this, then this. And so it really is another case by case thing. Um, obviously, there are other things you can do alongside ventilation. There's you know, shadowing and screening. In our offices here, we have breeze delay, um, which, which helps, but we also have um, a degree of comfort cooling. So it's the same temperature all year round in our offices. So that really is the facade design in a nutshell. Um, the the, the take-home points, I suppose, is it's, it totally depends from site to site to site. Um, but a, a decent acoustician on your side can tell you how much of each you need and give you some advice as you go along. One of the the main concerns though about offices are, is internal sound insulation design, it's separation between separate spaces. And if, we're, if we get contacted by a company who feel their offices aren't up to scratch, then it's often to do with, I'm sitting in this room and I can hear this person next to me and I need to be having a confidential call. Um, if you think of say, an HR director's office needs to be extremely and secure acoustically because no one around it should be hearing any conversations that go on in there. So we'll, um, we'll have a look at how you basically design a wall to be good or a floor to be good acoustically. So there are some um, descriptors that are often used to describe sound insulation between spaces and we, we won't go into them in detail now. Um, but suffice to say, there are various ways of describing 
um, the performance of a wall, of the performance of a floor acoustically. Um, and basically there are two types of sound uh, transference. There's airborne sound, which you can see in the image here is this uh, woman talking, and it's either going around the partition or through the partition and being heard on the other side of the wall. The other type of noise is impact sound. So imagine there's a, a, another office directly below. They don't want to hear people walking around all day or scraping chairs. That would also be very distracting. Um, so that is another thing really to consider as, as designs progress. So we're often asked, how, how do we improve this wall? You know, what, what I, we need to achieve a certain performance that we'll touch on in a second. But how do you actually go about doing that? So you can imagine the most basic wall possible is two layers of normal plasterboard either side of a metal stud. Now that is obviously very narrow, but not very good acoustically. So there are various ways you can improve that. Um, and the first thing that often pops into people's minds is I'll put some absorption in the, in the middle, some, some, some sort of uh, insulation. And that does make a big difference, particularly with partitions like this. Um, you can also look at adding mass either side of the wall. So in this case, adding um, extra layers of plasterboard or heavier plasterboard, there are different kinds. Um, but that also has a big improvement on the performance of the wall. Um, where low frequency performance is particularly an issue, um, then adding depth or a cavity width, if you like, um, improves the low frequency performance, but you still want to maintain the mass and the absorption. And best of all, if you can add isolation between the two sides of the wall, so if there's no continuous um, path, noise path through the stud, or if the studs are connected with acoustic braces to, to basically isolate the two studs, then that gives you your best performance. And so the, the point I'm really trying to make is a good acoustically performing wall isn't a narrow wall. And it's often the case that we get um, brought in on a, on a project where they say, right, we've got 150 mils for this wall and it needs to achieve this. Uh, what design do we need? And unfortunately, the answer is often actually you need a wider wall. And so allowing for enough wall depth at the offset, at the, so the layout stage, is absolutely crucial. The other type of noise I touched on is, is impact sound insulation. Um, there are no, building regs covers this for residential development, but not for office to office. Um, and so really it's a best practice type thing. And the, the way to control impact sound, and again, impact sound is people walking around or scraping chairs. You know, that thud, thud, thud of someone walking above you that we, we've all experienced at one point or another. Um, adding absorption into the system doesn't do much. Adding mass and depth doesn't do much. What you actually need is some sort of resilient floor finish. Now, typically in offices, that's carpet, you know, carpet tile. But um, increasingly, due to aesthetic considerations more than anything, we're seeing hard floor finishes put down. Um, you know, trendy offices with exposed services and all that sort of stuff, they don't want to carpet on the floor necessarily. And so um, more sort of inbuilt impact resistant systems are often the way to go. And they go underneath, say, the tile and above the slab and they, add, they offer that impact resistance. But again, we would look at that on a case by case basis. So again, A233 provides um, some detail about this. Um, that it gives two figures where um, the minimum requirement between two offices should be 38 dB difference between the, a noise made in one room and the noise received in the other, D standing for difference. But where privacy is important, you need to achieve 10 dB better than that. Again, the, the HR room example is a good one. Um, it's at 48 dB difference. Uh, it's possible the voices can still be heard, but the conversation is not understood. Um, but it does make the point where internal ambient noise levels are low, it might be necessary to design higher insulation values. So in a particularly quiet office, 
the conversation might be more understandable. And we'll, we'll touch on um, how internal noise levels can affect intelligibility in a minute. Um, 8333 also provides a table where you can basically look up the sensitivity of a room um, and the privacy requirement, and it tells you how to design it. So it's a really, really useful document. Open plan offices, obviously you, in an open plan office, you don't get the opportunity to add a wall between, um, between the, the, the two uh, users of the space. That's the whole point. Um, so the, there's, there's more guidance on in, in 8233, but really um, the best you can do in that situation is put up some absorbent faces, absorbent face screening in between um, the, the desks that require separation. Um, at the moment, obviously that screening probably will be non-absorbent and, and wiped clean, but under, under normal circumstances, absorbent face and at least 1.5 meters high. Um, low ceilings and absorbent ceilings can also assist and we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. But um, in open plan offices, it's, uh, it's more difficult to control the noise, obviously. Um, but that's the best you can do. Now, there are a few um, common issues we see on site. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on a couple here. So the, the really common one in offices are continuous voids above suspended ceilings and below raised flooring. Typically, you might need them to run services around a building, or you might need to you know, run electrical cables under the floor. Or, um, or anything, you know, it's, it's very, very, very common. Um, but they are obviously providing weak points for noise to basically travel through the floor, through the void, and then up again. Or equally, through the suspended ceiling, across through the void, and down again. And so really, you need to be trying to mitigate that as much as you possibly can. The best solution is uh, to extend the, the partition um, up to the soffit and down to the slab. But that's not always possible because a lot of office design relies on flexibility of where you can put the, the walls and the floors. They need some flexibility as the design progresses, as occupation changes, as it transfers from shell and core to a, a full fit out. So where you can't do that, um, there are loads of different products out there. Side rise are ones that we come across quite a lot and have recommended in the past. But essentially they're void filling products. So they, they either hang down from the soffit, oops, try from there. They either hang down from the soffit and basically add mass and insulation into that cavity, or they are wedged between the slab and the raised floor. And both of those are quite effective in stopping that, that noise traveling through the void. Another very common issue is crosstalk attenuation. Um, very commonly, a vent will have uh, an opening to one uh, uh, occupied space and another, and it uh, sort of travels directly through and noise just clearly just passes very effectively through. So you can buy um, or specify or install um, what are known as crosstalk attenuators. And they're basically adding um, absorption within that duct run. Um, and they can be very difficult to install retrospectively because they do need a bit more room. So again, looking at the design early is key and making sure space is allowed for where these things are absolutely necessary and can't be avoided. Obviously avo avoidance is the, the best mitigation, but where you can't do that, then um, adding some sort of crosstalk attenuator is the best you can do. And finally, another thing we commonly see on sites where their issues have presented themselves is, is a workmanship issue. Um, and there, there are all sorts of things that tie in with workmanship, but um, this picture I think is quite a good example. It's not actually of an office, um, it's of a community centre with residential buildings uh, directly above, residential dwellings directly above. And the community centre wanted to have live music. Um, and so they, uh, we helped them design the, the space and it was uh, basically a heavy concrete box upon which um, the residential units were sitting. 
and they were sitting on these black rubber pads that you can just see in that image. Unfortunately, when they poured the slab for the residential units, they allowed a load of the concrete to spill out and basically bridge the gap over the rubber pad. And instead of being able to have live bands, we went and tested it. And the, the most they could have was actually a, a bloke with an acoustic guitar type noise levels, which wasn't what they were looking for at all. But the building was built and, and removing all of that uh, issue would have been very difficult. So um, that's where workmanship really is a good example of where workmanship really let a, a site down, unfortunately. But um, so good, good quality control as the, the building progresses is, is also key. Um, so that again, in a nutshell, is internal sound insulation design. And considering all these things early is really the key there. The other thing that we, if a, an office is occupied and we're, and someone gets in touch with us, reverberation control is the key thing. And reverberation is basically the echo, the echoiness of a room. Um, ideally for office, separate offices will be less than a second and for open plan offices you'll want it to be less than half a second. Um, high reverb levels can cause problems obviously so poor speech privacy, um, it can be very noisy, noise can build up and up and up um, and if it's very noisy then that, that leads to poor speech intelligibility and communication becomes an issue. So you can see how that can be a major issue for offices or meeting rooms. So here's uh, Here's an example of a project um, where we actually carried out some 3D acoustic modeling. And the modeling essentially, you build the room and you set up a speaker that fires out a load of sound waves and you can see how the sound pings around the room and how long it takes to decay. Um, so, and the other thing this, this software produces is audio examples. And the audio example is actually a German chap um, saying a sentence. And so before treatment, uh, if you were standing in this theoretical room, it would sound like this. Now, you, you may not have heard what he said there. Um, the, you can sort of hear the echo, certainly. So after treatment, and we'll get on to what treatment means, it sounded like this, and hopefully you'll be able to hear it a bit clearer. So hopefully you heard him say cat acoustic simplified demo oralization, which is basically just the test sentence um, within this software. So you can see how adding absorption into the room had a big impact on speech intelligibility. Now, absorption can take many, many forms and is often driven primarily by the aesthetic of the room. Um, but also there are cost constraints, also practicality constraints. But um, within any room, there, there are you know, hundreds of options that you could choose from. You could, uh, it's very common to treat ceilings because walls are often taken up with um, artwork or doors or windows or that, that sort of thing. So there are many, many options for, for ceiling treatments, but where you can treat a wall, then there are sort of funkier designs or more plain designs. Um, and you can even add soft furnishings and carpets. They do have an impact on, on the, uh, the environment within a room if all else fails. Obviously, we would rather see um, some more permanent uh, more permanent solutions than adding a sofa because what happens when someone takes the sofa away and, and adds in a trendy hard chair. Um, so really the key here is ask your acoustician. You, you go to them and say we have this space, um, we want it to look like this, what do you think will work? And they will work alongside you and come up with the best solution for your, your specific example. Rain noise is quite uh, an a key issue and is often overlooked. And I, I always use the example of uh, an office building I once did a course in. And um, every time it rained, and I, this course was going on over winter and it, it rained a lot, we couldn't hear the instructor 
because it was basically a metal roof with absolutely nothing stopping the rain noise. And you can imagine how that might have an impact on productivity and communication within an office. Um, again, there's guidance on how loud rain noise should be or could be. Um, but the, the concentration communication piece is, is key. The solution totally depends on the roof construction. Um, something like a heavy tile roof wouldn't have any issue. Uh, however, a metal roof, as, as my example a second ago, you need to have some sort of um, a separate ceiling construction with some insulation in the void created between the roof outer and that separate ceiling. Similarly, there are plastic roofs, um, but uh, the only solution for those really is adding a layer externally. Often plastic roofs are chosen because they're also the, the window. Um, into the space. So things like these transparent or um, blocking type roof um, can basically stop the rain hitting the roof in the first place. Glazing, um, double glazing is key. Again, it provides that separation between the layer that the rain is actually hitting and the layer facing into the room. But generally adding mass, adding a softer material or introducing cavities, that, that's how you deal with rain noise. Um, but it's often overlooked and needs to be considered very early in the design because it can influence the design of a roof or the ceiling space underneath the roof. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that um, where noise levels are low within a space, then you might need to improve the sound insulation of a wall to ensure privacy. Um, and that typically is in quieter areas, say you're not building next to a busy road, but you're, you happen to be building in the countryside, not near anything, it can be very quiet and that problem can be, can be um, exacerbated. So if background noise is too low, it affects speech privacy, but also indirectly affects essentially the sound insulation performance of a wall. Um, it lowers the sound insulation performance. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's too high though, then you won't be able to hear what other people are saying and you won't necessarily be able to concentrate. So it, it's a fine balance between the two, two things. So really you need to control internal noise levels and you can either do that if you are next to a, say a constant busy road, you can control how much of that road noise comes in. You can control it through internal services. So if you do have mechanical ventilation, then making sure it's not too loud and not too quiet is often the way to go. And that's what we have in our offices. Our, our ventilation and fan coil units are actually relatively noisy, but that helps um, with concentration, helps with speech privacy. But you can also get these noise masking systems. And they are proprietary systems where you it literally install speakers and they can be hidden into a ceiling and they play white noise. And I'll, I'll give you an example of what that sounds like. Now, depending on how loud you had your speakers there, that may have sounded very intrusive and very annoying. But if you have that at a sufficiently low level that you go into a room, you might notice it at first, but almost immediately your brain would filter it out. And all it would be doing is essentially stopping uh, or aiding in the speech privacy and aiding in communication without really impacting on your your day-to-day -day work. So it's, it's often a, a, a good, solution in quieter areas. And uh, the last thing I want to touch on is mechanical plant design. Um, now this, depending on your, your discipline and, and your involvement, um, this may or may not sort of come up, but um, mechanical plant design really comes under two broad topics. So internal services, so MBHR, so mechanical ventilation, or fan coil units, so air conditioning, and external plants, so um, any air source heat pumps or air handling units or condensers or anything that might be serving the office such that um, significant external noise might be generated. Um, so internal services can be a significant noise source and as I said a moment ago it can impact if it's too loud 
on concentration and privacy, but it can be used to your advantage as well. Um, where it is too loud, controlling through attenuation. So you, you put these attenuators in the ducts associated with the units and they cut down on the noise. And external plant is, it's more of a, um, a planning issue, if you like. Um, often any development might have a planning condition attached to it, which essentially says noise from external plant can't be louder than a certain level. And that certain level will be set by the noise survey that you did right at the beginning, beginning of the process. And um, the, the design really um, would be uh, controlled through detailed modeling. So in this case, um, all these red um, crosses are items of mechanical plant. These blue lines are actually um, noise barriers. And we modeled the effect of putting a noise barrier around these plant areas in line with the um, planning condition to make sure that this neighbor at the bottom of the image wasn't unduly impacted um, in line with the planning condition. And so that is a sort of key thing for particularly developers and builders because they have these planning conditions they have to comply with. Um, and through detailed calculation, that's really how you assess the mitigation. Um, the mitigation, as I said, can be a barrier, but it can also be things like these louvered enclosures. Um, and really, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I know it was a, a bit of a whistle stop tour, but um, the sort of key messages, I suppose, are consider things early, um, where, wherever possible it's um, important to try and accommodate acoustic design into the early stages of the development to try and stop shoehorning it in later and it, not, and, and it being a bit of a compromise. And also um, having an acoustician on board early helps with the development design and make sure your aesthetic gets maintained um, as, as you go along. So uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell and I think we're opening up for questions, so Phil. Great stuff. Thank you, Sam. That's been a really comprehensive and instructive. Um, we had uh, one question that came in through the talk, but actually you answered it as it went along. So that's all been very oh, good. Uh, so I, I have, there aren't actually any other questions uh, active at the moment. So I had a couple myself, um, yes. being rather self-indulgent. <laughs> um, and, uh, and my own personal experience um, as, a, as a, a designer of office spaces is that there's quite a lot of um, tension between the amount of uh, acoustic absorption that office spaces might need and the cost and aesthetics and and I just wondered what your view is on how you go about approaching the design of these spaces to minimize adding uh, acoustic absorption. Um, well there are certain things you can do so um, certain surfaces are obviously more reflective than others so large areas of glazing whilst they can be very attractive they can they are very reflective in terms of noise. They also are quite poor performing in terms of sound insulation between the spaces. Um, and so we would never recommend a window between say an executive office and another executive office where privacy is important. But um, in terms of reverberation, glazing is, is tricky to deal with. In, in a small room with a large area of glazing, that's where you probably need the most absorption. But having, um, Things like soft furnishings or curtains can help um, can help minimise the amount of proprietary acoustic absorption you need. But you can also um, basically have it as your ceiling. We've we've all seen the sort of drop-in tile suspended ceiling type thing, which acts both as the the sort of shield so you don't see the the building services, but also your acoustic absorption. And so it's trying to balance the aesthetic versus the price versus the anticipated performance. Um, they, it, it should be, I, I, sh I should say that all of this, none of this is, is sort of building regulations or legislation. This is all good practice design. <clears throat> and comfort. And so if a compromise comfort, needs to yes. be made, then a compromise needs to be made. Um, obviously as acousticians, we want it to be as good as we can acoustically, but within the confines of the project. Great stuff, thank you. Okay, we have had another question come in. Um, yep. So the question is, um, with offices being part occupied during this current time and therefore being a lot quieter than normal design allowances, 
is there a better solution than installing artificial background noise masking systems? Um, turn up your ventilation. <laughs> um, Which or, you need to do anyway. Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, you don't have to install these things. You can, for example, um, just have it playing on a speaker in the corner of the room or have a, a few small speakers is better than one loudspeaker because the person next to the loudspeaker is getting absolutely blasted. Um, but a few small speakers dotted around the room and you look on Spotify or you download a, a WAV file of white noise and you know, you're, you're, you're pretty much there as a, as a stopgap. Um, my, uh, the, our director, Patrick, who, who set the firm up, whenever he goes to stay in a hotel, he takes a noise masking system with him because he prefers to sleep in a noisier environment. And so he always takes a white noise generator with him. And, and so these things do exist. You can buy a white noise generator or you can play it through a Bluetooth speaker. You can do that sort of thing. Great stuff, thank you. Um, okay, another question. Um, so well-being, which obviously is a very topical uh, subject. Um, well-being in the office environment is very important now. How does sound uh, affect a user's well-being? Um, well, there are increasing numbers of studies where, um, and some quite worrying studies actually, where people exposed to excess noise levels in their day-to-day -day life. And the, the studies generally focus on uh, residential um, dwellings, but it applies equally to offices where, where people um, are exposed to excess noise levels, it can have an impact on their physical health. And there, are, there seems to be a correlation between people living in high noise level areas, but in older developments that haven't been designed particularly well, and high blood pressure, for example, which can lead to medical issues. Similarly, um, there's the sort of second and third order consequences of um, lack of uh, concentration within an office. Um, it's quite common for people who don't, don't feel like they've got enough done that day or weren't productive enough. That can lead to stress levels rising as well. And so there are all sorts of studies going on, but um, it, it, there can be physical health issues associated with um, excess noise levels as much as the mental health. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so another question. Um, I mean, obviously, we're all going back into our offices um, uh, well, potentially all going back to offices uh, at much lower uh, occupancy densities, so people are yeah. further apart. Um, and so the impact of, of staff who are um, further apart than they might normally be trying to talk to each other is going to be mm -hmm. a real issue. Um, yes. I have a, a partial answer to that question from our own experience, which we're about to try, which is encouraging people to actually use you know, Teams or Zoom to talk to each other even yeah. when they're within the office, if they're not, if they're not within a kind of a reasonable distance. But are there any other solutions that you've come across? Um, well, there, if you have sort of um, discussion areas which can still be socially distanced, if a, if a conversation is going to go on for a long time, um, I mean, prior to COVID, um, I'm, I'm currently sitting in our, our meeting room and we have a relatively open plan office behind me. Um, prior to COVID, if we knew a conversation was going to go on for a long time, we would come in here. Um, now, um, we would encourage people to do the same so it's not distracting for everyone. But yes, I mean, the, a, a good solution would be to avoid the conversation altogether. <laughs> um, or if you have to have it, then... Uh, talking at a normal volume but over teams or zoom or skype or whatever um is is a good way to go excellent okay and then uh, that's the last question we have from the audience at the moment i just had one more which i think yeah. um i mean obviously design is a very integrated process um and uh and and thinking about all the things that are important at the early stages of design um you know is key to getting a really good building at the end of the process and you know, from your experience, which are the most difficult aspects to kind of get into a project if you're if they're not considered from the very early stages? Um, I would say certainly the sound insulation piece, um, where not enough space has been allowed for, um, or where there are inappropriate adjacencies, so a very noisy area. So, for example, a, a plant room, 
um, where there are you know, water pumps and boilers and all sorts of stuff going on right next to the most sensitive room in the building. That wall needs to be much, much better than it would if the, the adjacency was much less sensitive. And so not considering layout early um, leads to difficulties in um, the wall design and not considering enough space for the wall design leads to knock-on effects. So that, that I say that's the key one. Um, yeah. But the, the second one I'd say is, is uh, reverberation. Um, people not considering, uh, you know, they, they design this thing and it's, it's a very trendy office and it's got an exposed surface and you, at Soffit and you can see the, the pipes running through and everywhere's glass and there's the espresso machine in the corner. Um, but it, it's unbelievably noisy. And it might look very good, but it's a horrible place to work. But they, um, you know, they filled the space with pipes and they want to still see them. And so aesthetically, it's not going to work. And so if the conversation could have been had earlier, then it could have been worked in around rather than trying to bolt it on afterwards. Excellent. Yes, yes. I've come across both of those. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure yeah. we all have at one point or another. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I think that that um, uh, probably uh, wraps up the talk and the questions. Thank you very much indeed for something that was really instructive and comprehensive. Um, oh. Just uh, a plug for our next event. Um, we've been developing uh, virtual tours as, a, uh, as an online event. Um, and uh, we're now looking at a date in mid-October for a, a virtual tour hosted by Biomed Realty to showcase their new research buildings at the Abraham Research Campus, which is a a biotech research hub just south to the south of Cambridge um, and that will be advertised on the BCO website shortly and I think that um, in, in some ways this is actually a really good format rather than a kind of fallback position um, it does give people the a chance to experience buildings that they wouldn't normally travel to um, the event as a whole has a very small carbon footprint um, and it's very time efficient for everybody um, and I think that the bit that we're all feeling a bit lacking is um, is the networking element um, that is difficult to arrange. So we're going to put our heads together and try and think of a way of, of improving that part of the experience of these sorts of events. Um, so really, just finally to say um, thank you firstly to Sam for a very interesting and engaging uh, presentation. Um, to Bryony, who is uh, from the BCO, who has been working very hard in the background to keep us all on the straight and narrow, uh, get this thing working today and dealing with the technology. Um, and then all, for all of you for making the time to uh, attend this event. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed it and it's been useful to you. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, yes, goodbye. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>